Tessa Savicki has a lot of kids, but she had considered having another one day. When her last was born in December 2006, she wanted an IUD implanted, a reversible form of birth control. Instead, she claims doctors at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield performed a tubal ligation or permanent sterilization. I'm only 35. I didn't say I want to have another child this minute. That's why I wanted the IUD. And no one's to say, you know, how far down the road I wanted, maybe wanted to have another one. It wasn't their choice, and now to know that I can never have another one, it, it does. It bothers me. Savicki is suing Bay State Medical Center, three doctors, and two nurses for allegedly performing the procedure without her consent. It's not right. If they did it to me, they could be doing it to other people. Savicki has received hurtful emails from strangers since her story became public. She wants people to know that her nine kids were born during a few long-term relationships. She lives with her fiancé, who is employed, their three children, and her 17-year-old son. Her mother gained custody of three older kids when Savicki was hospitalized with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma several years ago. She is unemployed and receives public aid for two of her kids. She's a high school dropout but has plans to get her GED like and that. teach one day. She maintains that the hospital violated her rights and she hopes that people don't rush to judge her. I love my kids. I really, from the bottom of my heart, I would not trade them in for nothing. So I don't care what people say about too many kids. You, I love them all. Women around the world have many issues that they face and need to overcome. And one of these issues is forced sterilization. Forced sterilization is the process of permanently ending someone's ability to reproduce. This has occurred around the world, including right here in the United States. The reasons for this atrocity also varies, as does the procedure. Forced sterilizations have occurred in huge masses. For example, in Nazi Germany, 400,000 men and women were forcibly sterilized. In Sweden, 63,000 people, mostly women, were sterilized. Over 800,000 men and women in Japan, as well as 11,000 women from Finland, were also sterilized without consent. American eugenics refers to compulsory sterilization laws adopted by over 30 states that led to more than 60,000 sterilizations of disabled individuals. American eugenics laws and practices implemented in the first decades of the 20th century influenced the much larger National Socialist Compulsory Sterilization Program, which between 1934 and 1945 led to approximately 350,000 compulsory sterilizations. America has a long history of embracing the concept of eugenics the core idea of which was that those who were deemed unfit should not be able to have children. The idea of unfit was wide-ranging and included those who were non-white, particularly black and indigenous women, those considered morally deficient prostitutes, alcoholics, and criminals, and those considered physically deficient, people with varying disabilities including manic depressiveness and epileptics, as well as those in poverty, especially the homeless. These atrocities have all happened in the last 50 to 100 years. Tessa Savicki's story is much more recent than that. It's in the 21st century, 2006, and it's not in Nazi Germany. It happened right here in the good old USA. Tessa wanted to take control of her reproductive life. On December 19, 2006, Tessa instructed doctors to insert an IUD after she delivered her ninth child at Bay State Medical Center in Massachusetts. Instead, the doctors elected to forcibly sterilize her on the operating table. In fact, her physicians, who apparently ignored the IUD she brought in with her to surgery, opted to exercise their own judgment. Now, under state and federal laws, a mass health patient must give written permission for permanent sterilization at least 30 days before the procedure. Tessa claims she never gave that consent, and the hospital cannot provide the consent form for tubal litigation surgery that was ultimately performed. What would motivate doctors to do this? Why would they break the law? And what gave them the right to play God? The issues in Tessa's case serve to highlight how prevalent these attitudes are in our society and how limited our conversations surrounding reproductive choices have been. 
Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in forced sterilization in America, Tessa Savecki's story with Tessa's attorney, Dr. Max Borton and Sid Gorovitz, partners at Gorovitz and Borton to examine these very important legal and societal issues of does a woman have the right to become pregnant regardless of her marital status, her financial status, or receipt of state assistance? Does a woman have the right to become pregnant regardless of the number of children she has already had? Does the government have the right to determine who can and who cannot have children? Does the government have the right to determine how many children a woman can have or limit the number of children in a family that it will provide financial assistance to? If the government does not regulate how many children a woman should have, does the medical profession have the right to make this decision on its own? If the government and the medical profession do not have the right to determine how many children a woman should have, does society have the right to make that determination? Should there be safeguards in place regarding informed consent, how the informed consent is obtained, by whom the informed consent is obtained, and when it should be obtained? The safeguard of informed consent is to prevent a Mississippi appendectomy by which the decision for sterilization is made without the consent of the patient and is undertaken and performed by the doctor as a part of a gynecologic procedure or delivery. Dr. Max Borton, a board certified obstetrician, gynecologist and trial lawyer and Sid Gorovitz have built their reputations based on aggressive and creative trial work. They have obtained numerous multi-million dollar verdicts and settlements for clients who have been involved in traumatic situations which altered their lives physically, mentally and financially. And it has earned them the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as some of the best trial lawyers in Massachusetts and in the nation. They have seen many innocent and hardworking people suffer needless injury. And because of that, they are driven to help people who have been harmed by the negligent actions of others. Their goals, not only to get justice for Tessa, but to make sure that all women are protected from doctors who have their own renegade and illegal codes of justice and to hold those doctors and hospitals accountable for violating the sacred trust and legally protected constitutional rights to protect women and uphold the law. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Waltham, right outside Boston, Massachusetts. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Max Borton and Sid Gorovitz to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. When I introduce Dr. Max Borton, I want our audience also to know that you are a trial lawyer, too. And you bring to the profession uh, a vast knowledge of the medical profession. And you, with your, you've been together, what, 30 years? We've known each other for over 30 years. 30 we've years. We've been together going up 13 years now. And you primarily do medical malpractice cases, don't you? Actually, our practice is limited to representing plaintiffs, the injured parties, yeah. in medical malpractice. You are a licensed, still licensed, uh, board certified obstetrician gynecologist with over, what, 30 years experience practicing medicine. 43. 43. But who is counting? Yeah. And also uh, were, was on the faculty at Harvard Medical School teaching. I was an associate professor of obstetrics yeah. and gynecology and reproductive biology. That's the title. Yeah. And today we're going to be discussing a case that has to do with reproduction and with consent. It's the story of Tessa Savicki. Um, tell our audience a little bit about who Tessa is and what is the significance of this case? Well, essentially, uh, Tessa Savicki is a woman who uh, had multiple pregnancies, and during her uh, previous pregnancy, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to have some contraception. Uh, the delivery was by cesarean section, so they did not give her any contraception at that time. Uh, she wanted what's called reversible contraception, meaning like the pill or like an IUD, yeah. 
something that you can stop and get pregnant again if you so wish. Mm -hmm. uh, because she did not get any contraception, she happened to get pregnant again before she initiated contraception. Right. And at this, in this pregnancy, she wanted to make sure mm -hmm. that she get what's called an IUD, intrauterine device, contraception. And she went out and bought one, correct? Well, she went, she had this surgery scheduled for a repeat cesarean section. And the afternoon before, she went down to the pharmacy at the hospital, mm -hmm. picked up the IUD and brought it with her to the operating room and gave it to one of the nurses in the operating room. Yeah. Is this, when I first read that, is that kind of standard that a patient can bring something into the operating room and say, hey, while you're at it, do this too? It's really not the standard procedure, but mm -hmm. in this particular case, I have to assume that because she complained that they didn't give her the IUD in the last cesarean section, ah. that she was told, we are going to do it, but you make sure right. that that comes to the operating room. Good. Since it's packaged sterilely, she could bring it in and they, they can open it up in the operating room. Mm -hmm. And she was supposed to get an IUD at the time of the cesarean section, and that's what the medical record shows. She got the IUD from the pharmacy at the same institution. It's not that she bought it outside and brought right. it into the hospital. It was just a way of saying, make sure it gets to the operating room. Yeah. And that's what she did. What happened, Sid? What happened was she had the delivery. Yeah. And uh, she was then told after the delivery that, uh, sorry, we didn't do the IUD, but in fact we performed a procedure by which you will not be able to become pregnant again. Tubal ligation. And had tubal ligation, correct. You won't be able to have children again. You won't be able to become pregnant again. Yeah. And that was so against what she had asked for, which she had specifically done the physical act of bringing the IUD up as if to say, you didn't do it last time. Don't forget me this yeah. time. And she winds up not being able to have children. This is not what she wanted. Yeah. Not what she asked for. None of this was discussed with her beforehand. And in Massachusetts, there is a procedure that ends with a signed off informed consent document right. that was never done at all because we've been through every aspect of the medical record. And it's absolutely clear that it wasn't discussed. She wasn't consented. She didn't approve it. She didn't sign off for it. And it is the law, I want to emphasize this, in this state and probably every state, right, that y in order for you to be sterilized, that's the Which is essentially word, what that is. That you have to give your consent. In this state, you have to give it 30 days in advance. And a search, an extensive search of all the hospital records, right, cannot produce such a signed document, can it? The hospital admit that they don't have such a document. Yeah. So this case is pending, this is pending. It seems right on the surface that they have screwed up. Well, what's happening is They've that- They've broken the law. Well, you're right, except that in every case of medical malpractice, mm. it has been my experience, our experience at the firm, that as soon as this comes to the legal arena. Mm -hmm. Everybody circles the wagon. Mm -hmm. And the idea is not so much find out what really happened, but what excuse can we put up that uh, they will have a difficult time convincing a jury. So For instance, in okay. this case, uh, one of the theories they're expounding is we got verbal informed consent, meaning uh, we talked to the patient. Yeah, but isn't it the law 
in Massachusetts, you have to have written consent. Isn't that the law? That's correct. 30 days prior to the operation. That's correct. So someone can come into the operating room giving verbal consent all day long, and it's not going to be effective, correct? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, in every operating room I have been practicing, mm -hmm. the circulating nurse, that is a nurse that brings the patient into the room for surgery, will double check that the patient has signed the consent for the particular operation they're going to undergo. In this case, a consent was signed for a cesarean section, not for a sterilization procedure. In essence, what I see in this case is that you have some doctors who are playing God, who are deciding who can have more children if they already have, and, and Tessa had, what, eight children already? She had. This was her eighth child. Yeah, so it had to be a decision, and we'll only find out when you do the, you know, the depositions, and the truth comes out. It had to be a decision that someone decided she's got too many kids. The fundamental question yeah. here is a question that has been posed to the Congress, to the Senate, to yeah. legislatures for many, many years, yeah. and that is, who can decide who gets pregnant, who can decide who can have a child, as well as the opposite, yeah. who has the right not to get pregnant and not to have children. Right. And that has been decided, has been decided at every level, in every state, yeah. and even in the country. Yeah. The state does not have that right. The state has no right yeah. to sterilize an individual. The state has no right to force somebody to get pregnant. Yeah. What are the specific challenges that you're going to have in this case? What you're seeing in this case is a classic, as you mentioned before, example of there is a clear wrong that went on here. Yeah. And that was the failure to have gotten the informed written consent mm -hmm. of Tessa Savicki. Absolutely. Then what you're going to see is the insurance company, the malpractice insurance carrier, circling the wagons, using all of its resources and assets to, we believe, paint Ms. Savicki in the worst possible light possible. Right. And that would be, how many more children do you think you're entitled to? Right. And are not some of your children, in fact, receiving aid from the state? Yeah. And this is a very nasty type of examination. We believe the attorneys for the hospital will try to put in place. Sure. Do you know all the fathers of your children? Yeah. This is very nasty. And this woman does not deserve it. Yeah. She didn't do anything to bring it on, but we believe it will be the hospital's attempt to move, to massage the Blame jury, the to paint her yeah. completely dark right. as a bad person and return a verdict for these doctors yeah. who were doing the right thing for in their best interest. As trial lawyers, you got a big task in picking your jury. How do you overcome, there are people that are gonna be saying, Tessa has too many children. Tessa's kids are on welfare. Really the doctors were doing something for all of us because we're gonna end up paying that ourselves. How do you overcome that thinking in the minds of some jurors? It's a very good question, and in Massachusetts, we are limited in what we can do with the jury pool mm -hmm. because we have limited questioning of the jurors, what's called juror voir dire. Right. We have only a handful of challenges that we can utilize in order to strike people who may have a philosophical perception that is clearly adverse to Tessa. Mm -hmm. But what you're left with after you've utilized your challenges is whatever 14 jurors, we use 14 in cases like this because of the length of time, are left over in the jury box. Mm -hmm. Other states allow you to go into a very intensive questioning, very intensive voir dire, and then to have those people struck because they are clearly adverse to the interest of at least one of the parties. 
We don't enjoy that here in Massachusetts. So it's going to be a Herculean task to try to put people into the jury box who are at least open to the idea that people should be in control of their own destiny. They should be able to decide how many children they have, and they should not have someone else making that decision for them Correct. without their specific written consent, as you mentioned before, Steve, in accordance with the law. Well, I want to thank both of you for spending time with us today. This case is pending, yes. set for trial next year sometime. We hope. And we wish you much success because the issues are extremely important. And those are the issues that need to be decided. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.